Hello, I'm Laurel Milberg, the current chair of the American Balance Society History and Continuity Committee. And I'd like to introduce two other members of that committee, Drs. John Selinski, below, and Jeffrey Sternley. In a moment, Jeff will be interviewing John, our esteemed colleague, from across the pond near London, England. But first, I'd like to provide some context for this interview. The function of the History Committee is to ensure that significant individuals and events in the history of the society are recognized and recorded. This includes developing um, and maintaining documents, photos, videos, and the like, which memorialize the development and seminal contributions of and to the society. We also recognize as emeritus counselors those who have provided long and valuable service to the society, publishing their contributions on the ABS website. While John Selinski has often been called the midwife to the birth of the American Balance Society, he is a member of the original Balance Society, the British one, and therefore has not been made an emeritus counselor. His many contributions and historical perspectives on the development of balance groups have not been recorded for our members' benefit. With this recorded and archived interview on our YouTube channel, we mean to correct and connect to this important missing link. Gentlemen. Thank you, Laurel. Thank you. You're welcome. So were you going to Hang on, or there you go. Great. Good to see Good. you. How are you? I'm fine, thanks, Jeff. How are you? I'm well, thanks. We've uh, just gotten sucked in by a big snowstorm, first of the year. Oh, really? Hmm. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Over a foot. Um, but we're managing. It makes it a nice, cozy indoor day. I um, mean, I was as Laurel was talking I was thinking boy if I uh, I was going to ask you a little bit about the beginnings of your experience with balance and I'm thinking uh, this would be ABS prehistory uh, yes yes it would no. hmm. yeah so why don't we start there I wonder if you could share a little bit about how you first became introduced to balance and what th what that experience was like for you Okay, well, I was first introduced by my um, elder brother, who was uh, a family doctor by, by that time when I was a, a medical student. He was quite a few years older than me. And uh, when I started to uh, show signs of being interested in general practice, um, he told me about Ballant and the Ballant Society. And I went to a, a sort of a general meeting for uh, anyone who might be interested, any, any, any uh, physicians who might be interested. Um, got interested in my, myself. Uh, soon, when I started in, in, in practice, realized uh, what the difficulties were with uh, handling the emotions of both patient and doctor, um, that I uh, noticed quite soon an advertisement in the British Medical Journal for a new balance group starting up. I applied and, uh, and that's how I started. And uh, the, the leader of that group was uh, Michael Courtney, who uh, um, was in, uh, in the US during the first uh, American conference in, um, where was that? That was in Charleston, wasn't it? Right, yeah. yes. And uh, he was a, a great role model for me, very, a very good, kind uh, um, group leader who was uh, not at all sort of, uh, didn't shout at anybody or get cross with them, <laughs> but it was very generally very encouraging, um, which was just as well because uh, my first reactions to the, the Ballant method were, were, were somewhat negative. Um, I, I couldn't understand why the leaders seemed to want us to just work things out for ourselves from the beginning, where they obviously knew all about it. And I thought, well, why can't they just tell us what to do instead of uh, you know, inflicting this guessing game on us? So um, this, uh, this was taken very seriously and uh, it was decided to uh, have a, a meeting of the group uh, devoted uh, entirely to Dr. Selinsky's problem, as we called each other by our surnames in those days. It was very formal to begin with. Mm -hmm. So we had this day and uh, I continued to um, produce ob objections to, uh, to the method 
uh, and at the end of which somebody said to me, I expect you'll be leaving now. And I said, no, I think I'll stick around for a bit. And so I've stuck around for about, I don't know, 30 or 40 years. <laughs> really? What do you think, um, despite having objections or, or struggles, I guess, early on, mm -hmm. what captured your interest enough to uh, stick with it so long? Yes, yeah, I was. Um, you want to know why? Why I want to stick? Well, um, I think to begin with, I, I wanted to be given some theory and shown how to do psychotherapy. And that really, uh, by that stage, wasn't what balance groups were about, although they started off in that way. And I could see that uh, I was uh, learning a different kind of skill by just going along with the, with the group. And uh, um, I liked everybody in the group. It was congenial. So uh, I went on coming and presented a case or two and be began to get the idea. Mm -hmm. did, did you think about it as um, developing kind of a psychoanalytic uh, mindset at all? Um, yes, in a, in a way, because my, my, my family were fairly steeped in psychoanalysis. My brother that I told you about went on to, to become a psychoanalyst and I combined see. that with general practice for quite a while. And uh, my mother had had an an analysis in the 1920s, so, mm -hmm. uh, so I knew all about it. Um, but uh, it wasn't the psychoanalyst, uh, psychoanalysis that put me off. It was perhaps the, the lack of psychoanalysis. Uh -huh. Right. <laughs> the, yeah, the, the lack of answers. Yes, the lack of answers. Yeah. You know, and w we had had a conversation um, um, earlier about where I asked you a little bit about the transition from balance seminars, um, which I guess were earlier than you got involved, hmm. to more of the group process that we're familiar with. Um, and you you said something about that the, the seminars are more exploratory and um, the, um, the groups uh, followed because um, I guess Ballant didn't feel a need to explore more, had a sense that it was the group, uh, the group process that the physicians needed. And I, I wonder if you could uh, um, elaborate or expand on that a little bit. Well, he started off, um, I have some transcripts of, of, of uh, very early Ballant groups uh, because in those days, everything was, was recorded and, uh, and uh, written out, typed out. And uh, uh, groups often began with, uh, um, reading and commenting on the, the transcript of the previous one, uh, but that rarely seems to happen nowadays. Mm -hmm. uh, so for the early ones, he was just asking the family doctors uh, what they thought of uh, mental health services in, uh, in the, the National Health Service and, and why they were discontented. And they found that when they sent uh, uh, a patient to a psychiatrist, the uh, they came back without really receiving any of the treatment that they they thought appropriate or really much help anyway because the the patients still came back to see their family doctor mm -hmm. and uh, it, it sort of developed from that into the idea of the doctors themselves presenting individual cases and talking about their difficulties in, yeah. in, in the consulting room it almost sounds like it had to make the shift to the group process or might not have lasted. Well, he'd had experience of, of group processes before in, in Budapest uh, long ago, mm -hmm. uh, where he was um, a, a pupil of, uh, of Ferenczi, the Hungarian psychoanalyst. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think he used to, Ferenczi used to hold groups for anybody who wanted to come more or less at the beginning. And, uh, uh, and I think, uh, yeah, that, the idea of groups was, was in his mind, I'm sure, from the beginning. Yeah. yeah. And uh, Enid Balint, his, his wife, played a very big part in these groups. That's not always known, but uh, more often than not, there were two leaders. Uh, mm -hmm. She was there as well. You know, I read um, a biography, an autobiography that you had uh, written uh, for uh, International Journal of Psychiatry and Medicine. And you talked about having car rides with Enid at one point, uh, almost on a regular basis. And it sounded like that was the probably 
might have been one of the best informal educations you had. I wonder if you could share a little bit about what that was like. So, sorry, I didn't quite catch what you said. The um, you had car rides. You had rides home from um... oh, the car rides. Yes, yes. Um, well, I, I was in this group um, with uh, with Michael Courtney for uh, four years, and then I got a, an invitation to come and, and help at a, a, a family medicine or general practice, as we call it, mm -hmm. training program where they had violent groups. And I said, well, I've been in a group, but I don't know how to lead a group. How, how am I going to get to know how to do that? Because there was no, no formal training. Sure. And uh, uh, Michael said to me, well, you can come and join a group that um, um, Enid and I are, are leading for uh, trainees, residents, you would call them, uh, at St. Thomas's Hospital. And so uh, I did that for, for a year and, uh, as you say, gave, gave her a ride in the, in the car on the way home, during which we could, uh, we could talk about what had got on, gone on. What was more impactful, the conversation in the car or observing the groups? Well, the combination of both, really. Uh -huh. What did you um, get from each then? Um, Seeing, seeing her, her way of leadership, her, her technique, and mm. uh, noticing that uh, she contributed much more than I was used to from, uh, from my group. And, uh, and she said uh, later in the car that she found with, uh, with young, inexperienced doctors, she found it necessary to, uh, to sort of provide some sort of framework herself for, for how to think about it. Mm. At what point did you realize that this was having an impact on your practice? I think uh, after the first case I presented in the in the group with with Michael Courtney, mm -hmm. um, I could see that uh, people had different uh, ideas about this patient and, and me from from the ones I had myself. Uh, they they were a bit alarmed about what what might happen to me. <laughs> I was getting too involved, um, and that was uh, that was quite uh, appreciated. That you know, people were caring about what happened to me. I mean, that sounds pretty significant. That it really um, helped you become aware of your involvement with that patient. It's like yes, you, mm. you can care too much, or something like that. Um, well, it was a mixture of feelings I had about this particular patient. Uh, um, I thought he was, he was potentially quite violent. He talked about doing violent things. Mm. Um, but uh, at the same time, we, uh, we had some sort of rapport together. Mm -hmm. And I wasn't really that frightened of him. And, but the, the group picked, picked up that side of him more than I did. Yeah. So did you see that? Um, that experience in the balance group starting to have an impact on your work with other patients as well? Yes, yes, I did. How would you describe how, what that, that impact was? Well, I could, uh, it's hard to describe really. Uh, I would pay more attention to uh, to the effect that uh, that they were having on me for for one thing, and mm. uh, um, I was aware after I'd presented a patient that uh, I could uh, picture the group in a little semicircle around me, listening and mm. making the odd comment now and then, <laughs> and, uh, yeah. so that their presence was quite uh, quite helpful, comforting. Yeah, it's almost like you had a little bit of a chorus with you in your surgery. Exactly. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Well, that I mean, that's uh, it sounds significant. It's um, um, helps you see yourself as well as your patient and, and what's going on. Yes. Mm. Yeah. That's right. Um, you know, this almost sounds like some of the involvement you've had with some research with a couple of groups uh, over the years, um, and of course, we know Ballant talked about training cum research. And I wonder if you might share a little bit of your experiences doing that research and um, some of your learnings and maybe even some of the unanswered questions you still have. 
Well, that's uh, a lot to uh, talk about. Um, Wherever you want. <laughs> I'll start off by saying that, uh, as you say, research uh, and training was uh, the uh, the byword, and uh, there were a number of uh, of groups that called themselves uh, research groups, quite quite rightly, and uh, they they worked on a particular topic uh, for a few years, and and. Uh, published a, a monograph, a little book, small book, um, on that subject. And uh, there was one on, uh, one called Night Calls, which was all about patients who called up in the, in the night wanting a visit. And another one about repeat prescriptions, people who just wanted a repeat of their prescription, but didn't particularly want to see the doctor. And so they, they for the period of the research, they, they limited their, the cases they listened to, to people who, who fell into that category. And um, this, the group that I was in, which eventually published a book called uh, While I'm Here, Doctor. Mm -hmm. um, is, is that, no, no, that's not, that was the one before. I'm getting mixed up. It was called, uh, What Are You Feeling, Doctor? That's right. What Are You Feeling, Doctor? Um, and we thought that it was time another research group got going, but we couldn't settle on a subject for quite a long time. We, we started off with accidents, but... Uh, of course, accidents don't happen to order. Uh, right. and sometimes a patient who has an accident, you never see again, or, or there doesn't seem to be uh, much of a problem going on there. So we abandoned that and um, started talking about an idea from, uh, from Tom Main, who is a very eminent, valent orientated psychoanalyst in, in Britain. And uh, he told, uh, not me personally, but told um, Michael and, and some other colleagues that uh, he thought it'd be a good idea if there was a group to look at, uh, at doctor's defenses and uh, that was what we settled on in the end. So uh, we, um, had, we really looked at ourselves much more and the sort of the key question we asked ourselves was would this patient have upset any doctor or is it just me? Mm -hmm. Uh, and uh, because we knew each other very well, we were able to uh, be less defensive in the group to start with and were, were more willing to, uh, to talk about events in our own past and our, our own feelings generally, not, not necessarily about the patient, which you might think was completely against the, uh, the, the Ballant tradition. But having been encouraged to do it by Tom Main, uh, we didn't feel any uh, particular problems with that. It almost in some ways sounds like it connects with what Ballant, Michael Ballant talked about with his apostolic function of doctors. Does that make sense? Uh, not quite, no. <laughs> okay, no, no, uh, no uh, here. Um, well, I mean, I know, I know what you mean, but I think apostolic function has been difficult to interpret what he actually meant. Okay. And my um, interpretation of it, uh, having sort of read up fairly carefully in the doctor, his patient and the illness references to it, it seems to me that the, um, uh, the doctor's apostolic function is, 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 is more, um, more harmful than, uh, than productive. And it's uh, something one has to be aware of and not, not become too much a prisoner of. Um, like there's the example of the doctors who says to a, uh, a depressed woman, what, what you need is to have another baby. Now go and talk to your husband about this and have, you another, have another baby and you'll see, you'll feel much better. Mm -hmm. And maybe sometimes it works because of the, uh, the effect of this personality. Mm -hmm. um, and there are other doctors who thought nutrition was important or, or, or coming off alcohol and, uh, and uh, this seemed to uh, influence them a good deal. But that's rather different from the idea of uh, a doctor as a sort of, uh, you know, somehow advising the, the patient in a more uh, non-directive uh, way. Okay. I guess I was thinking about it as um, a self-awareness piece that um, clearly is different than um, defense mechanisms, but again, it's a piece of... Yeah. The doctor brings into the interaction um, and um, only defense mechanisms a lot yes. more specific. Yes, uh, well, it, uh, if the patient reminded us of someone in our own 
uh, mm -hmm. past or present, then uh, you know we would would feel more free to to talk about that. Yeah, yeah. Do you, do you wonder um, why um, maybe there hasn't been more attention to defense mechanisms? It sounds like most research um, is geared more to the outcome for doctors than it is yes. for mm -hmm. self-awareness. And I, I wonder what your thoughts are about that. Well, it, uh, it's quite difficult to, to, to organize a group like that to, to go on for a a number of years when uh, everybody's busy and uh, there there might have been a, a sequel to it you know another group c carrying on with the research but uh, that that has not happened so far yeah so um let me shift here to really one of the main reasons we wanted to talk a little bit more mm -hmm. um about your involvement with uh the united states balance community and yeah. um maybe get some of your thoughts or perspectives uh, having observed us from before we were an organization um, to, you know, for several decades, just some of your observations of um, what that's been like watching us. Well, yes, I went, uh, I, I met um, Clive Brock in, in London when he was uh, over here and uh, we talked about Garland a good deal and uh, he invited me to uh, come and visit in, in Charleston and, and see what uh, what was going on there, which I did. And uh, I was uh, introduced to everybody in his department and they all told me wh what they were doing. And I sat in on some groups and met Alan Johnson and everybody there. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I, I was very gratified to find that there were people across the Atlantic who uh, had really very similar thoughts to, to those uh, I uh, was familiar with at, at home and, and that uh, their groups were very not very different from ours. Um, and uh, I knew that they were interested in the fact that we had a, had a society and some kind of formal structure and uh, they wanted to uh, have a similar society and uh, so I Tell them the kind of things that, that we did and uh, and what our what our constitution was like. Brought a copy of the constitution on my on my second visit, and uh, I think it was uh, the basis of the eventual constitution for the the ABS. Although maybe all the British elements have been removed by now, but they were the kind of skeleton at the at the beginning. Mm -hmm. You you seem to. Um minimize the impact you had uh, when whenever the subject of being called the midwife uh of the balanced society and i i wonder um is that or i, I guess i wonder where that comes from uh, what your is it your own humility um or are you thinking really you didn't do that much um let me think Well, I, to, to go on with the uh, with the midwifery metaphor, mm -hmm. uh, it wasn't my baby, uh, um, but I was somehow present at the birth and, and assisting with, with with difficulties or providing something of a of a model, which um, it, it was very similar to what they what they were already doing because uh, um, they had had uh, contact with with the, the, the balance and their and their colleagues and the not too distant past. So uh, I think I was just there, really. Validating it, perhaps, in the international uh, perspective. Yeah, well, you know, I think about that very much in the role of a balanced group leader, in a way. Yes. So you, you both were validating what we were doing. You were also, and as you said, modeling uh just from your own experience with uh, the british balance society yes mm. and um and pr providing maybe a little bit of an authority um for it uh, um i guess so yes yes and I, it sounds like um that was really significant i think i think there's a certain value of your presence on a, on such a regular basis on, on so many milestones for the organization um, including getting folks involved in the international very early yes yeah 
Well, I, I always enjoyed uh, coming to, to the United States and uh, came an amazing number of times, really, in those early years, sometimes two or three times a year. Yeah, and continue to. It's, um, you know, it, it, it's like a thread that uh, goes through um, the uh, organization, really. Mm, well, I'm pleased to hear that. Yeah. Yeah, I you know I uh, when I was looking at some of the history, it, it seemed like the early days there was a lot of involvement with the international uh, IBF, and then for a while there was less, almost no connection or, or very little, uh, and then it started up again. Um, let's say in the last ten years or so, maybe fifteen. Yes, yes. Um, I think when um, when Don Nees became. Uh, international president, uh, he sort of got it going again after something of a, a lapse. Of course, uh, Frank Dornfest had been president right. before that, and uh, he was quite influential too. But uh, yeah. I think um, after his term was over, uh, well, I was going to say Americans stopped coming, but they never came very much at all until, uh, I think probably until the, the, the Charleston uh, International Conference when uh, I think you folks realized that there were people all over Europe and other other continent continents who were doing doing ballads and having groups and that it was part of an international fellowship. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, and, and um, I certainly recognize Don Nice's role in um, increasing the interest uh, as well, which you know led to us holding another Congress. Yes. Um, mm. You know, in Philadelphia. Um, I, I wonder, you know, one other piece to this is, uh, and you've been involved in um, Ballant leadership training um, a fair amount here, certainly. Um, you often get asked to be faculty, and I'm guessing you've done some training in Europe as well, in London uh, or UK. And I wonder what your observations are about the current state of Ballant leader training. Well, uh... I think you've influenced us by uh, um, making it more structured and, and, and formal. It was it was um, it was pretty much casual in in our days. You know, going back to when I was told if I wanted to learn to be a leader, I I should come and listen to Enid Ballant doing it. I mean, you can't get much better than that. It's true, but but uh, uh, to actually um, have some kind of supervision of what you're doing afterwards uh, is good. And she actually ran a, a, a workshop for, for people who uh, were just beginning to be leaders uh, until, until her death. And that, that continues still. Um, mm. So that's a, a form of supervision for everybody. And now people have individual supervision, just, just as you do, and, uh, and um, need to have been um, leading, leading a group with a more experienced leader for some so many months or sessions or whatever. Yeah, so it's uh, it's more professional now, perhaps. Mm -hmm. But yours was like that from the beginning. <laughs> yes, I guess it was. It was um, again, you uh, you talked about meeting Alan Johnson, and I think he was very instrumental in structuring our intensives. Oh, sure. Mm, yeah. You know, what you've been part of. Um, I guess I wonder about, um, I know that Michael Ballant had this uh, interview he had after having too many people drop out. Oh, yes. And um, I wonder if there's something about that, about having people have a pre-involvement interview to see, to help them learn more about what this is about. Um, and I wonder what your thoughts are about doing something like that. Well, you have to uh, look at how, how successful it was. Uh, um, and uh, it, 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 it probably prevented some people from, from, from joining who, uh, who would otherwise have done so and, and might have been a bit disruptive if they'd been allowed in. But uh, thinking back to my early career, my own early career, I would probably have been one of the excluded ones, uh -huh. <laughs> you know, not suitable, <laughs> too argumentative, <laughs> to, but one can, uh, you know, one can learn about it, one can change, it's all about change, really. Yeah, yeah, personal growth. 
Mm. Yeah. Well, I, I wonder if suitability is not so much a function of, of challenging uh, what's going on, um, but uh, being open to some of the uh, discussion that the challenges create. Yes, yeah. Um, you've talked a bit about, um, at different times, uh, your role in introducing the pushback. Oh, yes. Uh, and um, I wonder if you might share a little bit about your thoughts about it now. I, I know there are pros and cons to that. Um, and I'm wondering where you stand with that now. Uh, do you want me to go straight to where I stand with it now? <laughs> well, you could give yeah. a little bit of history of it. Yes. Yeah, um, yeah. Context for that. But the history is quite difficult to, to trace. It, it seems to have begun with uh, with Germany, the German groups, mm -hmm. um, and they have uh, longer sessions than than we do, um, and uh, a long, it seems, tradition of the the presenter being asked to to sit just outside the group and listen uh, and then be brought in again. But because uh, the uh, discussion of one case might go on for uh, an hour and a half or more, uh, there was time for the presenter to be brought back again and maybe even sit out a second time. So uh, the presenter was able, able to um, both sit out and, and contribute quite a lot by being in as well. Um, um, I think it's, it, it's a very powerful process uh, pushback, but it, it has some disadvantages, uh, I think. I'm be coming to think that it has some disadvantages too, mm -hmm. um, because uh, um, I think that, uh, um, as you know, as you have written about recently, uh, People have experiences when they're sitting out, uh, which are, are very influential and, and, and important. But um, um, I wonder whether the experiences are more about themselves than about the patient being being discussed. Uh, and I think there's a, a danger of losing losing the actual patient if the presenter sits out for too long, um, because he or she is the only person who's who's met that patient. Mm -hmm. And it often reflect his um, what he or she says, or, or the things that the way they behave often reflects the patient in the in the parallel process, uh, and and maybe that gets lost if mm. the uh, doctor is having his epiphany. Mm -hmm. it, I mean, it sounds like in a way that's one of the management challenges for a group leader would be to manage the in and out part for the presenter. Yes, yeah, I agree. And, uh, and that's what I try to do now, uh, to um, ask them to sit out, maybe starting off trying to get the group members from a questioning mode into a, into a, you know, a thoughtful, more introspective mood about their own reactions. And if if they go on questioning the presenter and the presenter goes on answering, then uh, it's a very good solution to 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 pop them out for a bit, but not yeah. for too long. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, I guess when uh, the balance were doing this, they didn't have a, a pushback. Oh no, no. And and did, what was it like watching in and manage the in and out piece? Um, well, well, she never did this. Oh, of course. Well, but in, t in terms of the presenter, so she never yeah. asked the presenter just to listen for a while? Um, sorry, can you, I'm not so quite I'm, following you. I'm wondering if she would ask a presenter of a case yes. to sit back a little bit and just listen. Uh, I, d I can't remember an actual that actually happening. No, but uh, huh. I think she she was very skillful. But it was it was a skill that's hard to pin down somehow. You you were aware that she was having an effect on the group without quite knowing how it was done. <laughs> <laughs> it's awfully frustrating if you're trying to learn by watching. Yes, yes, but uh, I think uh, in a sense you probably couldn't learn from her because. Uh, um, I mean, when when this this 
workshop, as it was called, for supervising young group leaders started, we we started to develop a tradition of our own, I think, because mm. uh, most leaders at that time, or a lot of leaders, were were, were psychoanalysts who uh, uh, didn't really grasp the Balint group process themselves very much, and they would uh, so they would sit quietly for a long time, and they'd suddenly come out with a great interpretative thread which went on and on for for quite some time, and then they'd lapse into silence again as though. It was, it was a sort of group analysis. So we decided that uh, as we didn't know anything much about psychoanalysis analysis anyway, most of us, it would be better just to keep stum and, uh, and uh, only, only speak when it was really necessary. Mm -hmm. So uh, we, we sort of cultivated that. And uh, uh, because every supervision, every group of this kind had a, had a uh, not only the presenter to talk about the group, but had a, a full transcript of, of what went on in the group. So there was no no question of not knowing exactly mm. what went on. Um, you may not have known quite the tone of the a tone of voice of the people speaking, but you could mm. see what they said, and you can see how much the leader was was speaking. Um, but if you listen to a tape, we've got one or two tapes of Enid Barlint, and and she actually talked quite a lot. Mm. Um, much more than anybody does today, I think. Yeah. Uh, all we can say really is that it sounds strange, but she would tell people what they had done, what they were doing, uh, sort of rephrasing it. Mm -hmm. And uh, this this was her her major way of. Uh, Interesting. Yeah. Know, well, she, she also wrote a lot about the flesh technique. Yes, um, and disowned it eventually. Uh, oh, okay. <laughs> um, like like the rest of us, mm -hmm. but there was this very very uh, big uh, change in the in the group methods. In the uh, in the the group met in the sixties, and the book Six Minutes for the Patient was published in the early seventies. Mm -hmm. And um, um, uh, Michael Courtney, my original group leader, um, was was present in the group that. Uh, brought about this this transition uh, and it was partly due to 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 Michael Ballant himself and partly due to the the family doctors the family doctors were complaining to some extent about the amount of time that the uh, original model of the Ballant mm -hmm. behavior uh, was, was was taking up because uh, um, in the in the early days um, from what I hear if uh, somebody presented a patient um, without knowing much about their background and their history, he would get quite cross about it and say, uh, you know, you don't know anything about this patient. You must uh, have a long interview with them of at least three quarters of an hour and, and then come back and tell us what you know. <laughs> so, uh, so that established a pattern uh, that the, uh, the group members, they're, they're a bit afraid of him, I think. Mm. Um, uh, would not dare to present a patient unless they they had done that, and uh, so it became a kind of family doctor psychotherapy because one long interview would lead to another, and if the doctor was enthusiastic, to another one after that. So they were really doing a, a kind of uh, a kind of GP psychotherapy and not a kind of uh, intuitive thing and listening out for what patients real wants were and that sort of thing so um the doctors felt that they were if they were doing these long interviews on three or four patients a week um they were not really um listening properly to their other patients who, who were excluded who were not given this privilege of being a being a special barlint patient <clears throat> so um michael barlint uh, then said uh, you know you're right um this uh, this kind of psychotherapy just just didn't fit with family medicine, and he called it a, a foreign body. Yeah. And uh, I said, from now on, I just I just want to hear about ordinary five minute or ten minute consultations, and uh, and uh, that's why the the book eventually was called Six Minutes for the Patients, although most of them happily got rather longer than that. And that's what we do now. Uh, people don't. Uh, say to the patient, I, you must come and have an, an interview with me for three quarters of an hour. Occasionally, occasionally that's necessary. But... 
So, so that was the big change. Yeah, exactly. Um, although I thought some of the principles she talked about are probably still principles that um, that get carried out in terms of um, not having too much of the doctor's own agenda, for example. Yes. Yeah. Listen. Yeah. So let me uh, shift to a couple other things that I'm curious about and interested in. I think other people would be interested too. Mm -hmm. um, you've written a lot about literature, um, literature that involves stories about doctors and patients. And I wonder if you could talk a little bit about the importance that has, you think, in um, physicians learning about their job, their role. Yes, well, as a, um, a course director, um, my, um, I had a sort of mission to uh, introduce something of the, uh, the arts into medical training because I thought there are, you know, they, uh, uh, another way of learning about human relationships um, uh, as well as being a, a source of continuing pleasure and refreshment. Mm -hmm. um, so I um, introduced one, uh, one session a term in our in our term programs of uh, getting everybody to to read a classic novel uh, and and we'd discuss it at the end of the term um, and uh, I had a, a friend who was a, a professor of English literature who uh, would come along and, and, and chair that that discussion and uh, and it worked pretty well um, they uh, not everybody read the book some people only uh, read part of it Right. Some just, and we, we also g gave them all a copy of the book, which uh, yeah. which they uh, that that had quite an impact. The idea that you were sort of symbolically being given a copy of Anna Karenina or or, or some other you know world classic, mm -hmm. and uh, so I I like to think that the book may just have been put on a shelf, but maybe taken down ten years later, even as they they didn't look at it at the time. Yeah. And uh, and I wrote a a couple of books just. Uh, Talking about how uh, human relationships are reflected in the in the great novels and tell us more about people and how they feel. Mm -hmm. Do you have some favorites that you tend to uh, like to talk about or recommend or suggest uh, that people consider? Yes, well, I've, I've mentioned one already. Uh, right. Because uh, uh, you know, top. Tolstoy starts Anna Karenina by saying all happy families are alike and unhappy families are unhappy in different ways. So it, it is all about relationships and uh, especially in families and, and, and between families. And uh, I think I tried to show people that uh, the people who turn up in the consulting room could be rather like some of these characters in the book uh, and vice versa. Do you think the discussions you had with students ever um, transferred to their role as physicians? I can't really tell. It's a good. It's a good question. Um, I think uh, what I should do is uh, we quite often have uh, you know um, old residents back to uh, describe their experiences to the current class, and uh, we could ask them if they remember reading the books and whether whether they think about them now. Yeah, that's a great post-test uh, question. Isn't it? Yes, yes. Yeah. Uh, so kind of connected to that, actually, in, uh, but from a different angle, is um, I'm curious, too, about your experience as an editor of the, uh, the British Ballot Journal. Um, I wonder yes. what it's <laughs> like collecting and reading and maybe even commenting on or making decisions and choices about what to publish. <clears throat> well, we uh, we only came out once a year, uh, we only, that, that, uh, and uh, the, word, the, the word journal actually means daily, so <laughs> it wasn't really that kind of journal. But I think people look forward to uh, to seeing it. But uh, we hardly ever turned anybody down. It was really a sort of um, uh, a house journal. Mm -hmm. um, but during the editing process. Uh, I would try and uh, improve on things that I thought needed it. Um, mm -hmm. Are there things you would like to see in the journal, in that that once a year journal? Um, yes. That um, maybe doesn't get in, that people don't think about uh, adding? 
Um, I think most things get in one way or another. Uh, it's quite quite varied. Mm -hmm. I'm rather sorry that it's now going to be online only from uh, from this year onwards. I think that's happened to a number of of journals. So it's nice to be able to hold it in your hand and flick through the pages. But uh, that is not going to happen anymore. But you have this um, um, a journal of psychiatry and medicine, which is seem to be fulfilling the same function. Mm -hmm. Is that right? Yeah, so you see that really is um, maybe as um, that's increasing in um, publishing balance related work. Yes, yes. Yeah, that, that has been significant. And uh, interestingly, uh, with John Freedy as one of the editors, it uh, goes back to Charleston again. Yes, that's right. Yes, yes. Full circle. Well, he seems to have uh, have plenty of influence there. Uh, about what uh, what will be published, and uh, of course, it's not not been so good for the British Journal because we used to have a lot of uh, uh, American contributors, you included. Uh, mm -hmm. But uh, that that doesn't seem to happen anymore now that you have a journal which uh, you know caters for your needs quite adequately. Yeah, interesting. I hadn't even thought about it that way uh, quite so much, um, and I think the the key difference was in house. You know, it's. Um, we've started an in-house balance and brief newsletter. Yes. And, um, you know, certainly the journal you edited was in-house. And uh, I think mm. that um, psychiatry and medicine is a little bit broader. Yes. Yeah. Um, I, wonder I, don't, what, I don't see those issues. <laughs> no, I know. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, one of the things that's happened a bit here in the States, I'm not sure if it's also happening elsewhere, um, is that we're doing balance often with groups other than physicians. Uh, for instance, there's a group for veterinary you know, doctors, and uh, there's another yes, group yeah. with uh, clergy uh, that I'm doing. Um, I wonder if you see balance applications um, continuing to, to expand that way to other folks who provide a service like that, like, like physicians do. Yes, um, certainly. Um, and that uh, uh, we've had a, um, a huge uh, increase in our membership uh, in the last few years because the, uh, the, uh, the College of Psychiatrists in, um, in Britain, which sort of regulates psychiatric training, has um, uh, said a few years ago that they, they wanted all uh, trainee psychiatrists to have uh, experience of uh, of some some form of uh, of talking therapy, and mm. they uh, they decided that uh, being in a balance group was uh, the a very useful way of, of doing that and easier to uh, to arrange. So uh, I think they all have to have a, a year's experience now, and as they didn't have any trained leaders or very few, uh, mm -hmm. uh, a lot of psychiatrists towards the uh, the end of their training. Uh, the senior residents and, and above uh, started joining and and, and uh, wanting to uh, to learn about group leading. So we've had a bit of bigger influx there, and we're now open to uh, to uh, to any any as you say anybody who works with people. Um, mm -hmm. And that we certainly have had groups for members of other healing professions. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. So the original. Uh, uh, constitution of our balanced society uh, limited it only to, to family doctors and psychiatrists were not admitted in those days. They could be associate members, but not not uh, complete men. Yeah, so that's a real change mm. you know, in the yeah. uh, formality of it or the the tight structuring. That's right, yes, yeah. Yeah, I guess that's a balancing act too between how much, I don't want to, I mean, I'm almost hesitant to use the word change, how much change occurs, uh, flexibility versus um, maintaining a certain amount of orthodoxy. Yes. Um, well, I think we've uh, managed so far. Uh, our, <laughs> present, our current president is a, is a psych psychiatrist and a psychoanalyst. And, uh -huh. uh, well, I uh, think about that all over. You know all the different ways that balance used in the different settings at uh, different countries. Yes. Yeah. Mm. 
Um, I think that there's a lot of overlap, but there certainly are places where different groups go in different directions. Yes, yeah. Yeah. Uh, I'm thinking about it. There are a number of things I wanted to talk about, and I think I've touched on many of them. I, I wonder if there's some things we haven't talked about that you think would be worth adding to this discussion uh, for others to <clears throat> learn a little bit more about some of the history and um, where you see things at now and maybe where they're going. Yes, you'll have to sort of give me give me something to uh, to start off with, something to bite on. <laughs> Okay. Well, I just, I think, um, you know, I think that there, there is expansion. You talk about expansion in, uh, in uh, the UK with psychiatry. Yes. Um, I think mm. that we in the States have interested more and more people. I think uh, the size of our society is gradually. Yes. Increasing. Yeah. Um, so I, I just wonder if you see this, you know, and, and in some ways this is not mainstream work. Mm. Mm. Um, so I wonder if that's a risk to balance to become too mainstream, or is this something that you see expanding as there's more attention to patient-centered medicine? It's. Uh, I don't think it's exp it's expanding to some extent in in, in Britain, um, mm -hmm. but not 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 hugely. Uh, mm -hmm. I think there's. Uh, People feel that they're too busy without realizing that uh, you know this could be a, uh, a help to to feeling more relaxed and at at ease with your your work rather than a, an additional burden. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, as, as you know, I, I think balance groups. This may be a bit her heretical, but I think. Barlink groups have a lot in common with uh, with other kinds of, of groups for doctors and other people generally. Mm -hmm. And I think some of the people, some including the doctors, uh, don't uh, don't really get to the core of the matter as far as as Ballant was concerned. Uh, and uh, uh, as a leader, I find myself that I'm constantly having to refer back to the doctor patient relationship, which is a, or the the healer or the helper who the professional whoever you are um, and your your client um, you know that relationship is really the core and uh, uh, we still get quite experienced people uh, pursuing the, uh, the solutions and answers to the problem rather than uh, uh, you know the question of how much have I been able to listen to this patient and what have I found out about him that was unexpected and you know that, that, that sort of thing. Uh, um, and I think but I think people in even if people don't do this very much they still enjoy the groups and find that they're getting a lot out of it. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I don't think we should um, uh, I think we should regard that as a, a value as well mm -hmm. uh, and people take different things away from the group, but um, they can be very helpful. And uh, even, even if they never really approach the core of what it, what it was meant to be all about. So really just a, a quick summary kind of statement. I mean, that the process is much more important than the product. Yes, yes, I think that's fair to say, but uh, that, that's why the, uh, the group a group that uh, is aff affiliated to and part of the Ballant movement is 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 not so different from a, a doctor's group that uh, that meets once a month, discusses to begin with what the difficulty in diagnosis was, and finding at the end of that discussion that they still haven't got a diagnosis, and they start becoming a Ballant group. Mm -hmm. I wonder if. Um we've developed a misplaced notion of research, the way Ballin thought about research. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, yes. And what your thoughts are about that? Well, my thoughts are that quantitative research just doesn't sit properly with, uh, with Ballin and, uh, and this is why it's so, so frustrating. Uh, and it's the same with, uh, with, with psychotherapy. Uh, you know, you can, uh, show that all methods are successful 
to some extent and unsuccessful in, in, in other people, but um, you can't really, uh, it's too sort of individual. Um, everybody's story is different. You can't really uh, apply statistics to it with any, any meaning. Um, mm -hmm. So uh, I'm in favor of more, more qualitative research. And uh, the, the Ballant Group has been described as uh, the first qualitative research done in medicine or very early, a very early attempt at it. Mm -hmm. well, I even wonder if the research Ballant was talking about is the individual research that each physician can benefit from in that process. Yes, I'm sure, yeah. Hmm. You know, so how do we capture that with a number? <laughs> well, the thing is, you have to forget about numbers. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. So not everything you can count has meaning. That's it. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Well. Um, but uh, that doesn't uh, that doesn't catch much much ice with uh, directors of education. That's 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 the problem, isn't it? As far as you're concerned, in America, right? Exactly. Yeah. Well, I've always contended they have to have the experience themselves. Yes. Yeah. Mm. Um, the the experience speaks for itself, actually. Yeah. But not everybody wants the experience. No. No, indeed. Indeed. Or one of the ways I've been thinking about lately is not everyone's ready for the experience. I, I think there's a readiness about it. Yes, yeah. And sometimes that comes later in life, sometimes it comes never. Uh, so yeah, it's kind of a, another one of the mantras of a balance group leader is patience. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, uh, I, I, I could go on and talk with you forever just because I uh, always enjoy your perspective on things. And, um, and as you say, um, you're always extremely responsive to ideas and, and your thoughts about them. And so I um, just really on behalf of our entire society, I both appreciate this uh, past hour um, and you're sharing decades of your experience uh, in one way or another. And, and we certainly have appreciated your midwifery, if that's the way to pronounce it. <laughs> um, but just your 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 presence, I think, has been absolutely significant um, all along the way. And um, uh, I know that um, our society has been better for it. So thank you so much. Oh, it's been a very important part of my life too. Yeah. Well, that's thank great. You. Well, um, let's uh, just. Quote, let's virtually toast to uh, continued uh, shared experiences. I'm sure that will go on. Yeah. Thanks again, John. You're welcome. Enjoyed it. Yes, likewise. Take care. You too. Um...